the uh, the uh, outrageous uh, suit suit uh, indictments, and there were to be other indictments in the future of uh, youth again paraded before a uh, uh, hate mongering uh, constituency so that their um, anger uh, could be uh, satisfied by uh, a sentence of uh, guilty. And we also know that the 40s represent uh, the uh, suit suit uh, riot episode in where for the most part whites, whether uh, members of the armed forces or not, in fact rioted and vented their anger and their frustration uh, on the Mexican community. But out of those, amongst uh, the positive responses that emanated both from the progressive uh, white community as well as uh, some responses from the Mexican-American communities was a kind of a bridge between them called the Human Relations uh, Commission of, uh, of the county. And in some ways, at least I feel that on uh, paper you can trace uh, some links between uh, an outcome of uh, the 40s persecution that helped uh, strengthen uh, youth uh, leadership possibilities in the early and uh, mid 60s and people such as Irene Tovar uh, Armando Morales, Dr. Armando Morales, who's been on the faculty uh, here, and a very young Sal Castro uh, were the human um, bridges between the experiences gained at earlier times and also um, um, the uh, uh, vehicles that uh, were available. Youth leadership is, is a very important important need uh, and in fact one might read the Chicana and Chicano movement in part as a response to uh, that uh, that need. When we see uh, the young people of today we have to understand that what uh, is needed is uh, more support but also more confidence in them. Uh, one of the constituencies that has to be mobilized in behalf of the crisis of today is in fact the millions of people within our own community and the Latino community as a whole to rise up and say, as uh, was said in the early uh, 60s, uh, or the late 60s, early 70s, uh, Despierta Chicano, uh, Defiende Tu uh, Hermano. And we are certainly going to need uh, those uh, defenses. Which of us is ready to do uh, and follow the example of uh, Sal Castro or somebody uh, of a different generation who has also uh, stood up uh, at, um, at the plate, uh, Professor uh, Leonard Valverde, who being from Arizona, though you may very well have roots in California, I'm not familiar with them, but being from Arizona and also uh, at the University of Texas, at least at a time, uh, so uh, generously supported the continuance of uh, the uh, uh, Camp Hess Kramer Chicana and Chicano Youth uh, Leadership uh, effort. In our celebration, we should remember that this is the year 2006 that we would want as a proof of our tenacity and our commitment to uh, the virtues of generosity and uh, love uh, that that leadership conference continues. We should think about an outcome for this um, event that involves all of you and all of uh, us in a recognition of the importance of youth and the importance of leadership that this conference needs to be continued. It can't simply be Sal Castro, members of his families, the volunteers that he has garnered, uh, doing it on a year-to-year -year basis. But some significant institutionalization has to be built into maintaining this. If any of you made critiques, and why not, 
uh, of some of the activities undertaken by youth. If some of you said, well, why did they do this when they should have known on the basis of past experiences they should have done that? Uh, why did they make their arguments in this vein as opposed to another vein? Granted that you are already talking about youth in the streets being activists, you're really talking about the fact that there needs to be uh, leadership training and mentoring. Saying it in those terms seems uh, mundane and, and beneath the dignity of uh, the heroism that we often associate uh, with, with activism. But if youth will uh, be continually important, then we have to provide for them in terms of the very unique uh, elements that uh, the leadership conference brings together. No better way of honoring the activists, whether it's of the 40s or 50s, or whether it's Sal and the people that work with them, to making that commitment, at the very least in our minds, and maybe more, the way Professor Leonard Valverde did, uh, to continuing this conference. And uh, as that, making a commitment to the continuing of our uh, future in ever strengthened ways, which is what uh, we really should be about. Thank you. Buenos dias. Yes. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of a different turn. Um, obviously, I'm a bit of an outsider. Uh, mujer, a little bit younger generation. And so, and I know Sal from a very um, different context and met him many, many years later after um, uh, these gentlemen did. And so I'm actually gonna depend on some of the research that I've done of women who were very connected to Sal, women who were part of the 1968 blowouts. And my research in the past has been, was on the 1968 blowouts, mujeres who were involved, their leadership, their resistance. And what I've done for today is take some of their um, reflections specifically about Camp S. Kramer, which is usually how they referred to it, or of course Mexican American um, Leadership Conference, and also about, uh, specifically about Sal, and take some of that along with other things that they talk about to, to give a context of the early years of, of the camp and in relationship to the 1968 blowouts. So as soon as we have technology back up, And you know what he's saying to you right now, right, Carlos? With those glasses. <laughs> Thank you. You can go ahead and, whoops. Yeah, I should be able to. 
Okay, real quick. Um, when I first started my research, I wanted to provide an alternative perspective to the historical narratives of the 1960 blowout, 68 blowouts that had only been told by males with a focus on males because of the stories told in my own family, particularly by uh, the mujeres in my family. I was really interested in how women reflected and talked about um, their participation because I knew I knew they had been there. I knew they were there, but I hadn't heard it in, in what I had been reading and, and studying. I also wanted to provide a conceptual framework that gives insight into the school resistance and grassroots leadership of Chicana students. And I'm not going to talk about that too much today, but that's helped me. Um, what Professor um, Gomez Quinones was saying at the end is how do we look at, assist, help, and be a part of with youth today in, um, in looking at resistance and leadership very, very differently. When I first started this research, people told me, oh, it, it's a really um, interesting project but it really wasn't the women who were leaders. I believe it was because most of us have a traditional conception of what leadership is. And so those who were most often in front of the camera, those who were most often the spokesperson, and I was trying to reconceive of leadership in a very different way so that we see, even in today's, um, what's been happening in the last couple of months, we can see youth all different kinds of youth, undocumented, uh, male, female, as being leaders in a very different way. Um, the interviewees, I interviewed eight women who, this is their, what schools they were at. There were three from Lincoln, three from Roosevelt, and two from Garfield. I didn't actually in, um, interview anybody from Wilson or Belmont. Eight women at the time, um, three of them, at the time of the blowouts, three of them were already in college but were graduates from these high schools. And um, I interviewed them, oh actually the date's down there on the bottom, in 1996, so um, just right over 10 years ago, it was in February of 1996, um, and I did individual interviews with all the women and they reflected on their participation, they reflected on the Camp Hess Kramer, on Sal, um, and then what I did is I began to analyze data and I brought them all back for a focus group. We met, met at Self-Help Graphics and all of the women except for um, Vicky Castro couldn't make that particular um, focus group that we did. But they came together and it was really interesting because in doing research you want to be able to give something back to people and have it be um, reciprocal and I was really feeling that I was imposing on these women, I, taking their time. And when I brought them together for the focus group um, at the end, they were thanking me that they got to, as a group, come back. Some of them had been friends. Some of them didn't know each other back then because they were at different high schools. Um, had, some of them were friends and then lost contact. And so the reflections that came out of that focus group are part of the video clips that I'll share with you today. Um, starting on the left is Rachel Ochoa, um, Rosalinda Mendez Gonzalez, Tanya Luna Mount, um, the person in the middle is Paula Crisostomo. So those of you who've seen the movie that is getting screened tonight, walk out. Paula is um, the young girl who's the protagonist in, in the movie. Um, Celeste Baca, Mita Cuaron, and Cassandra Zacarias. And one of the things that came out in almost all of the eight interviews was how they talked about that they were being groomed. And several of them, more than one person used that term. They were being groomed to be activists, being groomed to be leaders. And so what I want to do today is uh, talk on three areas in how they were being groomed. One was the Mexican American Youth Leadership Conference as an impetus for participation in the school walkouts. How uh, four of the eight women actually participated in the camp prior to the walkouts, although more of them had participated more than one year. Um, they went several years, or um, somebody like um, uh, Celeste, it was later when she was a teacher, went back um, at Sal's request and, and participated. So many of them have maintained that kind of participation. And then I want to talk about transformational mentors and role models as influential to others. One of, of course, that is named is Sal Castro. And then the multidimensional and contradictory influence of gender that they talk about. The weekend camps were held at Camp Hess Kramer in Malibu. The student participants were assigned to cabins and college students served as camp counselors and workshop leaders. Four of the women, like I mentioned, um, had participated prior to the blowouts. Paula, Vicky, Rosalinda, and Rachel. 
They remember the camp as a beautiful place where they were given a framework to understand inequities and where they, were develop where they developed a sense of community and family responsibility. As one of the women put it, these youth conferences were the first time that we began to develop a consciousness. Rachel says, first of all, it was a nice experience because you get away for a whole weekend and the environment, the atmosphere was quite beautiful, very aesthetic. Being by the ocean, yet you felt you, felt you were in the mountains. It was very affirmative. That's where you began to have an identity. You weren't with your schoolmates. You could be more open. You could say what you wanted to. Rosalinda says, well, when we started going to these youth conferences, there were older Mexican Americans. Now, we were, in, we were high school kids, so older was probably 20s and early 30s. They would talk to us and explain a lot of things about what was happening. And I remember they were opening up our eyes. After those youth conferences, then we went back and started organizing to raise support for the farm workers and things like that. And so while the camp fostered uh, traditional conceptions of civic responsibility, traditional conceptions of school leadership, many students left motivated to organize around more radical and progressive movements. Rosalinda um, describes um, how those conferences motivated them to organize. Upward Bound and Campus Kramer gave us a framework, a perspective, and a language to use. Oh, and do we have volume turned back up? Okay. I don't know if you heard it. She said um, she didn't know if it was planned that way, and that, or maybe they just didn't think we were as smart as we were, or that, and we would do something about it. And that kind of um, not knowing how much of it was planned, particularly in the early conferences, and how much of it um, kind of it played out that way, at least in terms in relationship to the blowouts, came out with a lot of the women. Um, the idea that there was some kind of a contradiction in preparing quote unquote traditional school leaders run for student council. The conferences were clearly important to the development of the 1968 blowouts because a number of students who participated in the conference later became organizers in the blowouts as well as in other social movements. Given these outcomes, it's ironic that the camp held an assimilationist perspective, at least in the public documents that were published early on, um, that were the that gave the conference goals as um, the such as like the things that would go home to the parents to tell them you know your child has been selected. The camp fact sheet stated that the purpose of the camp was to improve self image and intergroup relations so that Mexican American students may be free to develop themselves into the mainstream Anglo American life. And so that kind of wording comes out of the. Uh, written documents, and yet at the same time, what the women talked about and what you see in, in, in Walk Out, the movie, is that something very different was happening in the content, in the conversations. Uh, one of the things that um, Sal mentioned to me when I interviewed him years ago was that um, it was a, Mex a Mexican-American thing and not real radical yet. He also pointed out that gavachos were in the authority roles. And so early on, I mean, even as we see the name that changes from Mexican-American to Chicano, early on there was this kind of discourse language that was used that was much more uh, assimilationist. Um, students were encouraged to be traditional school leaders, run for school offices, and go to college. The student participants were selected by either a school, a community person, or an organization based on their ability to contribute to the group, as well as on their ability to return and create progress in their own communities. What's interesting is that the school leaders who were well liked by teachers and recommended very often by teachers and other adults, or, or they were liked by their peers, uh, such as Rachel Cho was head cheerleader, Paula Crisostomo was a student officer. Many, uh, or most of the eight women I interviewed were also high track students, were A students, so they were well liked. Yet they talk about what the reactions were from some after the blowouts. So some people that encouraged them to be leaders, and this is separate from 
uh, Camp Hess Kramer folks, but some of the teachers who recommended them for these kind of camps were the ones who then turned around when they were using their leadership skills in a way that challenged the educational system. Um, um, these students were outsiders. They were marginalized. Um, Mita Cuaron was actually um, suspended for a full month and then couldn't pass a history test because she'd miss a, a history class because she'd miss so much. And even peers, there were some peers who didn't participate in the walkouts who saw these young people's leaders before and then really turned in terms of seeing them as something different. The women spoke to the contradiction was not in what they were doing as A students, head cheerleader, and then blow out participants. But what was the contradiction was in how people reacted to them when they used their leadership skills in different ways. Um, let's see if I can do it without him. Oh, then you're, can you click, yeah, click on me, sorry. The things that made us see the leaders before the lockout, the things that made us see the students were the fact that we really believed in things, we really cared about things, we took things very seriously, we worked hard at them, we spoke up in classes, that's why we were in student, that's why we would get elected to be officers of uh, clubs. So I think that when we stood up and spoke up for the things that we saw happen, to I think, you know, to us, or maybe at least speaking for myself, there wasn't a duality. I was just doing what I normally did. I think what was the duality was in the reaction we received. Because if you're speaking up in class, you get A marks. If you're speaking up to, you know, to run for student body office, you get A marks, you get the vote. But if you're speaking up on issues that the power structure does not like, I mean, that's what happens in schools today. So it wasn't that for us there was this contradiction, but the contradiction was in the way the very same behavior, the very same principles that you stood up for, the way that they, that, that they were responding to. The only time that was different was um, the, w um, well, actually, sh Rosalinda was a college student at the time. Um, the other two college students said it, they were penalized less than high school students. High school students, many of them were marginalized, both by peers, school officials, and community members. High school students, uh, the college students actually said in some ways it brought us attention. It made us um, somebody. But for the most part, most of these young women experienced, they were penalized for their participation, even though um, they felt they had really been groomed to do this, something like this. Uh, and again, they felt they were penalized not by the people that they were naming as some of these transformational mentors and role models. Let me just say a little bit about what I mean by that. Um, uh, Professor Solorzano, who's in the audience, and I have worked um, and trying to develop more around looking at this idea of transformational resistance. And, and briefly, we are defining it as a positive oppositional behavior in which students are aware of social inequities and are motivated by emancipatory interests. In other words, it's that being pissed off, but doing it in a way that somehow moves a social justice agenda forward. And then we've talked about transformational role models who are visible individuals who actively demonstrate a commitment to social justice, which is slightly different than transformational uh, mentors who draw upon their own experience and expertise to actually help guide the development of others in that pursuit of social justice. So it's a, a more of an active relationship. A role model may be someone who doesn't have a relationship with um, youth, and, and role models are certainly important. But a transformational mentor is really um, working with young people in the pursuit of social justice, whether it's first just exposing um, and understanding social inequities, and then kind of that next step is, when we're that pissed off, what do we do about it? The women named a, a number of different people as transformational mentors, but um, six of the eight women really went into detail talking about their mothers as transformational mentors and, in, and named their mothers in, in very different ways. Again, this gets to that idea of if we can think about leaders uh, in, in a very different way, then we see other people as leaders. And the same goes for transformational mentors. Sometimes we think of those who are out in the forefront um, 
um, leading the marches, but not necessarily who's organizing, who's doing behind the scenes. And so these women really felt like mothers were um, their transformational mentors. God, my mother, was always active in the community and in the school. She formed the Mother's Club, and she was in the PTA. And as I got older, she used to drag me along. That was her way of keeping me busy and out of trouble. Given the neighborhood that we lived in, because we lived in the housing projects, federal housing projects, he, she used to drive me along to meetings, and I would help her. So I had that early training. Paula names that um, her mother, that kind of activism of her mother, specifically related to her training for, for later for the blowouts. This is uh, Rosalinda. You know, we were poor, but compared to the people in Mexico that were poor, we were well off, okay? And I remember that every time we'd go across the border, my mother always, always had money to give to the poor. So I remember learning from my mother compassion for people who were suffering and for people who were poor. Rosalinda specifically talked about her mom was not um, uh, an activist, but she learned this from her mom. And much of it was actually based in kind of a, a Catholicism that Rosalinda problematizes also. But this notion of compassion for poor, whereas some of the women like Paula had mothers who um, were out in the community doing different kinds of activist work, particularly Mita and um, Mita Cuaron and Tanya Luna Mount, whose parents had been activists, um, socialists since the 1940s. And so different kinds of backgrounds, but yet, yet still naming these women in their homes as transformational mentors. Still another woman, Rosalinda, tells us how she did not grow up in, oops, sorry, wrong one. <laughs> Um, moving to um, uh, the women, uh, I interviewed eight women of them, several of them, um, most of them mentioned Sal, um, several of them went into real detail about how Sal was a transformational mentor, what that meant to them in terms of preparing them for, for leadership and grooming for what the kind of activism they were involved with. Celeste Baca says, I would listen to him, Sal, and the class, and in that guidance class was where he would talk to his students about, you know, lack of quality education and so on and so forth. A guidance class was basically where you started to plan your future. And they would give you these little tests to see what uh, you seemed to be, what your preference was. Was it clerical? Was it business? Was it going into science or whatever? And then after the test, he'd say, see, this is a bunch of bullshit. They're trying to track you into these different things. So, you know, I was listening to him also. And he's a very dynamic person. As a teacher, he was fantastic. <laughs> um, this is Celeste, and she has more to say, but one of the things that's interesting is Celeste was um, a high track student, and her recollection, Sal, was at these time you didn't have the high track that you had the lower track students. And she was, um, she mentions that she was Sal's secretary, which I think at that time was like, you know, like a student assistant. And so she was actually in his class listening, but she wasn't in the class. And then she decided to take a history class with Sal. And even though it was the lower track, she was supposed to take whatever the history was for higher track. But she, she knew from being in that class and from lin listening and what she was receiving from Sal in, um, in kind of a non-traditional educational setting because that's, mm, she was supposed to be, you know, the secretary in there. Um, she talks about how that, I how that influenced her. Thank you. And so she, I, if you heard, she said Sal was educating the masses, that these weren't necessarily the leaders, and I think when she said that, she actually meant the leaders in the school in terms of the ch head cheerleader, 
student council president, that kind of thing. But these were people that Sal on a day-to-day -day basis cared about, motivated, and talked about um, this is bullshit and you should be going to college. And that was, was very meaningful to Celeste. So what becomes clear from the oral history data is that the values that motivated these students and their awareness of inequities, both of which are fundamental to their transformational resistance in school, stems at least in part from transformational mentors, whether it be in their family or um, teachers such as, such as Sal. Rosalinda remembers how influential Sal was in exposing her to the rich heritage from which she came from and helping her to see herself as part of a collective, part of um, Chicanos, Mexicanos, as well as a collective of what was happening socially at the time, connecting to other international and national movements. Okay. So there was a up of her talking is the other women nodding their head when she talks about I mean and this is so powerful and again that influence I, I think um, Carlos, she said at the beginning of um, the idea of one person does make a difference she started to talk about how Sal kind of just started telling them you know about the Aztecs and who you come from as a people and things and all of them are nodding their heads remembering like kind of that first uh, awareness as 15 16 year olds to all of a sudden have a curriculum that had completely excluded them or actually devalued who they were and to have a, a teacher who was it wasn't in the books they were using but who told them that told them and gave them this kind of information I'm going to switch to the last topic which is the multi-dimensional and contradictory influence of gender that the women um, talked about um, gender a interacted with sexism with patriarchal relations personal agency certainly in terms of family relationships um, to shape the participation and leadership of women in the blowout. The social, cultural, and temporal milieu all contributed to what was expected of young women in 1968. And although these women ventured from these expectations, they were very aware of them, even at the time. Paula said, I think that my home life, in one sense, brought me up very traditional, and I definitely know what the female, I knew what the female role was supposed to be and what it wasn't supposed to be. Um, even uh, Vicky Castro talked about she grew up in a very quote unquote traditional family and um, was supposed to get married and that kind of thing. But she had, from her dad, that was a real clear message. She had so many brothers who really encouraged her to go to school and college. And also, she said that really helped me when it came to the movement because I was used to fending for myself with, and I, and I forget right now, four brothers I think she has. Um, and so I was used to that. And so some of that played off into how I was able to interact. Um, in the movement, in the blowouts particularly, because it was so male-dominated in terms of who was able to speak and those kind of things. Um, this is Paula. And, um, one of the children that I was in it, and so I was the mother to a lot of kids, basically. And so in the home, I did, it was expected to play a role. And on some levels, but on other levels, They were the little kings, but that was never said at home. 
that was that contradiction where she said things like Upward Bound, Camp Hess Kramer pushed us to question, to begin to look at these entities, and yet much of society expected us to, to be humble. And so that was that contradiction that, uh, again, some of the women pointed to. It gave me a lot of self-esteem. You need that as a Chicana growing up. Um, Cassandra Zacarias talks about um, mentors, but it wasn't until really it seemed during the discussion of the focus group that she started realizing that many of the mentors were males. And the women talk about, particularly in relationship to Camp Hess Kramer, of how many visible males there were and how they were encouraging young women um, who had been, are being conditioned by society to be humble to actually uh, be very active. And I know I gained a great deal of self-esteem from having all these adults, and now it's interesting they were all men, all these mentors. Mm -hmm. And my mentor was, of course, Margaret's father, who I told you that I felt like it was part of the group of my growth that I had. That I gave me a lot of self-esteem, a lot of confidence, and a lot of that self-esteem. And just, you need that thing, too. As a, Rosalinda Mendez Gonzalez also offers comments that demonstrate how the influence of gender interacted with various structures and social systems to offer a multidimensional influence. First, she acknowledges that few people raised the question or offered a critique of patriarchy in the early part of the Chicano movement, a point with which most of the women concur. Yet Rosalinda experienced sexism in a personal relationship. Second, she points to the fact that it was the older males involved in Camp Hiss Kramer and other organizations, rather than females, that encouraged her and other young women to become involved in blowout-related activities. I think that when we participated in things initially, there wasn't a consciousness of patriarchy. If you were a young man or young woman and you saw injustice, whether in regards to the farm workers or in regards to our college, you spoke out and got involved. Now, in my case, I very early on began to encounter some patriarchal hostilities from my own boyfriend, who very much criticized me for taking an active role in speaking out. But he didn't convince me, nor did he succeed in holding me back. I was just very hurt, but, it, but I didn't accept his arguments or his reason. I encountered it at a very personal level. At the same time, there were a lot of men, older men, that were encouraged me to speak out and participate. And she talks, she actually went into detail about one of the incidents that took place at Camp Hess Kramer her boyfriend at the time was also a participant, and that's where he, he, he told her, you, 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 she spoke out during one of the group discussions, and he told her, you, you sounded like a fool. Why are you doing that? And so it was within that Camp Hess Kramer where, in a very personal level and a personal relationship, she experienced that kind of sexism, and yet it was in that Camp Hess Kramer where she was really feeling that there, were, um, um, uh, there was a space for women to be active participants. Rosalinda explains that after the blowouts, as the movement began to gain momentum, this, she encountered increasing evidence of sexism and that women began addressing patriarchy as a system of domination. In fact, she argues that in many cases it was the female students who were at the forefront of the movement and that male students tried to hold young women back and move on to move, move into the more uh, visible leadership roles, keep them from moving into more visible roles. Um, and again, the contradictions, it wasn't just that simple. Tanya Luna Mount really speaks to what certainly a lot of feministas wrote about in the early movement is this idea of kind of having a double life and, and what Tanya talks about is some males love the movement but not in their homes. And let's see if we can find her. Oh, sorry. Many of these people that know the movement or whatever have a double life. Many of these people 
apologize. When I ran this on, an, on a, other speakers, it actually was really loud and really clear. It was very powerful what she said because she talked about this idea of, um, I'm gonna go save the world. She says, I'm gonna go save the world today. You need to stay here and take care of the kids. And she said, no, what we need to say as women is we can save the world and we can bring the kids or we can leave them at home or we can just not save the world today, but we're gonna do it together or not. And she talks about what we learned from those experiences in terms of, um, she really begins to move into current day movements in, in terms of how do we work um, collaboratively, both in terms of gender and she also goes into um, with other allies and other social movements. The last thing I wanna just put up there are implications in terms of um, maybe things that we can during um, lunch and throughout the day talk about is how do we understand the Mexican American Youth Leadership Conference, Chicano Conference now, as a transformational space? How do we think of, but more importantly, well, related to that is, um, Professor gomez Quinones said, beyond SAL, how do, what becomes institutionalized so that it's not just um, people responding to SAL's requests that we come? How do we make sure that a transformational um, space like this continues for another 40 something years, but also how do we continue to create transformational spaces given our social, socio-political reality? So what is it about the Chicano Leadership Conference um, that has been positive, that has worked, that we can take to continue to create other spaces? How might educators and parents help nurture and sustain positive forms of resistance? In other words, in what ways can we be transformational mentors and role models? What are those qualities? What are those things that individuals like Sal, some of these mothers were doing that people who um, 30 years later, I interviewed them in 1996, remember, they remember this as what motivated them. And, and again, this is remembering a particular event 30 years later and there's still certain people and certain events and certain things that stuck out for these young women and ha or, uh, um, who were young at the time, very young at the time, still were young when I interviewed them. How do we apply what we've learned from participating and studying in earlier move, uh, social movements to the current immigration reform and activism? And that's already come up in terms of what's happening now and, and um, how do we apply, be engaged and also support our, our young people? Thanks. We're going to have a few minutes for questions at this stage, but uh, we've got another panel to uh, come up uh, very, very briefly. So uh, uh, let's, uh, if you have any questions uh, while Juan and Rudy and Dolores are still up here, uh, any questions at all? You'll have to scream them out. Okay, well, you know, what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna move into the next panel. Um, I also wanted to note that um, I met uh, Paula and Bobby Verdugo at the last Chicano Youth Leadership Conference. Uh, Sal, when was that? A few months back? March. March. March? All right. Uh, Paula has seen that cycle complete itself. She is not. Uh, she really wanted to be here, but she's up uh, with uh, her son's graduation. She's attending the graduation of her son. Um, and I think Bobby was going to be here today. Is Bobby in the audience? Not yet? Bobby Verdugo? He's on his way. And that's Rita Ledesma back there. <laughs> Hello, Rita. Um, uh, okay. Um, hmm? Speak into the speaker. Uh, that the archival work that Dolores is doing is so just, I think, just right on target. Uh, Jose Angel Gutierrez, uh, for you that don't know his uh, particular co uh, collection at Arlington, he has uh, about, what, right now, 80 in, uh, interviews, uh, Jose? 77. 77 on uh, uh, digitalized on uh, uh, on the internet, they're from Arlington. It is fantastic, it's a treasure trove. An awful lot of uh, uh, interviews with uh, uh, women activists in La Raza Unida Party. 
we have to do things like that here in Los Angeles or we're going to lose that historical memory. You know, the big legacy of the Chicano movement was that civil rights legacy that we passed on to the immigrants today because they're a different group than that other group. And I think that, that archival work is just so important. And so I'd like to commend uh, Dolores here. She's done an awful lot of good work there. Let's take a break, uh, stand up. There's still uh, refreshments outside, and we'll uh, reconvene in just a, a few minutes. <laughs>